Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, a philanthropic community partner since 1922, and a proud supporter of numerous community organizations. More information at smithville.com. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. The season has changed, but how are you changing the season? Meet Hoosiers across the state that embrace the power of time. Meet a Columbus sculptor that captures the changing seasons in ceramic masterpieces. Be inspired by spoken word artist Arnell Darden as he chases the sun in his poem, Today. Follow the history of bluegrass in Indiana as we explore Bill Monroe's legacy in Bean Blossom. And welcome folk singer and acoustic guitarist Jason Wilbur to the studio. Embrace the changing season across Indiana on tonight's weekly special. Welcome to the weekly special, I'm Daryl Neer. At this time of year, Hoosiers are often reminded of the passage of time. The leaves change and fall to the ground and the new year seems just around the corner. For Columbus artist Robert Pulley, this passage of time circling throughout each year has been an inspiration of his art. I grew up in Wabash, Indiana. There was a place I'd hike out to about five miles from my home were places where the water had started eroding the stone into these little basins that were perfectly round. Just the idea that the stone extends down into the earth and the water is moving over it, it just was a magical combination. Clay is so open-ended, it doesn't really have a form of its own, but it'll take any form you put it in. When I started working on a large scale, at first everything was improvised. I liked the physicality of them, and, and to me they almost have a projection of energy. When you come up to them, you feel them, and you you know you feel them like in your guts. You know, it's like this piece impacts me. So it's that kind of energy that I'm after. As far as the kind of things that I'm exploring, it's, it's on a subconscious level. I don't plan a line of attack or anything. It's just kind of all the flow. I tend to work on five or six pieces at a time in the studio. And I will set out and start everything. Once it's started, then on a daily basis, I try to get out there and put another coil on. And then I pinch it up, which raises them about three or four more inches from what it was the day before. And then when I get done pinching, I sit back and I look at it from different angles. And I'm looking for where is this line going? Does this surface want to be a soft, open surface or does it want to be an active surface? When it's almost dry, I have little tools I made out of sharpened rods. And I sit and just pick, 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 pick. So all these marks are individual pick marks. And that ends up being the biggest time consumer, maybe three or four hours picking textures on one piece. The glaze is done with a sprayer. I work real fast. <clears throat> I sit back there and just kind of intuitively spray the glaze on. And I'm just kind of accenting and trying to harmonize the form that I've made. But my main interest is the form. It's always the form. Nature makes such wonderful things, especially with stone. The forms of stones are not accidents. They are the result of physics at work in the layering of the stone, the way they dry, the way the, the frost attacks them, finds weak spots, fractures things out. Field stones are, are tumbled from Canada. So what I'm doing in my art to some degree is like trying to express this 
coming and going, you know, the fracturing off, the strength of life, the strength of life, you know, trying to find a place for itself in the world, uh, the strength of growing forms, organic, animal, or, or plant. Some of the forms that I find uh, cropping up are references to the human figure. If you look around, you see hips, shoulders, but they're really not any of those things. They're just forms that look organic and remind you of the body or of these trees. I mean, so a lot of the form is not me creating forms, it's me recognizing something in the forms. So that sense of life, I think, is, in, is interesting to me, as well as the sense of decay. And each of them is kind of a, as much information about the world in one piece as I can put into it. That's what I look for in art myself, for something that's bringing me a new message that um, is inspiring me in some way, that astounds me or, or just makes me feel good. So my hope is that there are people who find the work and that, that it does that sort of thing for them. To see more examples of Robert's incredible work or to purchase a piece for yourself, visit his website, robertpulley.com. Artists are often inspired by the passage of time, but spoken word artist Arnell Darden is more focused on living the here and now. Today. Today will follow the sun until it belly flops behind the horizon and then meet it on the other side. We don't have to know where it's going and we don't even care. We just know we have to be there. They tell us the sun is hot, you'll burn. We say you get what you earn and so we chase. We don't care about the shared, better than looks on the faces of the nations we trek through because we're running. And we know that when we catch him, it'll all be worth it. We know that their disdain for us, for something different, for peace, is the only thing they agree on. But we've noticed something. We've seen that he is the only one they all look up to. So maybe if we capture and devour him, they'll stop looking down their noses at us. Maybe if we cage him up, charge honesty and the truth to see him, they'll tell us how jealous they really are, as those better than looks melt right off of their faces. Maybe we'll catch him today, but maybe not. Either way, we are artists. And some of us will capture him with brushes and palettes, some of us with pencils and markers as permanent as gravity. Some of us with words he doesn't quite understand that make him shine green with envy. Some of us with voices like slow avalanches and just freed slaves. Some of us with movements that mimic Pegasus in Harlem in 1929. Some of us with our very own bodies, sculpting nine-month masterpieces before life tries to chisel their beauty away. We are artists. And we'll chase the sun until it squeezes behind the trees like poverty into the American dream. We'll chase him until he finally surrenders his light. We'll wrestle him down and make him submit to us his deepest, brightest secrets. And maybe then, maybe the world will realize that the light they once needed to live might just live in us. Keep chasing. If you would like to hear more extraordinary spoken word artists in the area, Bloomington's Players Pub hosts a monthly spoken word show. Learn more at theplayerspub.com. For several weeks, we've been tracing the history of bluegrass in Indiana through the amazing story of Bean Blossom, Indiana. Tonight, we conclude that series with the father of bluegrass himself, Bill Monroe. By the 1950s, the people in the small town of Bean Blossom, Indiana had grown their passion for live country music into the renowned Brown County Jamboree. 
but after a little more than a decade, the venue needed a new owner to reinvigorate its shows and grow its legacy. Fortunately, the father of bluegrass himself, Bill Monroe, had fallen in love with the Jamboree after he performed there in the early 1950s. He began playing there regularly and soon had taken over management of the venue. Even though Bill Monroe was born and raised in Kentucky, his Hoosier roots ran deep. In 1929, at the age of 18, Bill moved to Indiana with his brothers Charlie and Birch. Bill joined Charlie working at the Sinclair Oil Refinery in Whiting, unloading oil barrels from freight trains, cleaning empty containers, and doing general janitorial work. Like other Southerners that came north looking for work during the Depression, Bill Monroe and his brothers brought their cultural and musical traditions with them. As they had back in Kentucky, they began playing at local gatherings, like the square dances held in an old storefront in nearby Hammond, Indiana. Along with their friend Larry Moore, the boys formed a group known as the Monroe Brothers, a country music string band featuring Bill on the mandolin. Shortly after, the Monroe Brothers were discovered by a country music program director who hired them as a square dance team, and the boys set off performing at a traveling variety show sponsored by the radio station. Soon, the Monroe Brothers could be heard on radio stations across northern Indiana, even performing their own 15-minute serial program on a Gary station. This drew the attention of the Grand Palace Theater in Chicago, which booked the Monroe Brothers to perform. Their next big break, however, took them even further away from the Hoosier State. During the time Bill was away from Indiana, his career skyrocketed. By 1936, RCA Victor signed the Monroe Brothers and released their single, What Would You Give in Exchange for Your Soul? Two years later, the Monroe Brothers disbanded, but Bill quickly formed other groups, including an early version of the soon-to-be legendary Bluegrass Boys. In 1939, Bill successfully auditioned for the iconic Grand Ole Opry, the venue that would help make him a star. To accompany his unique mandolin melodies and high tenor voice, Bill Monroe added Earl Scruggs on the banjo and Lester Flat on guitar in 1945. With this classic lineup, the Bluegrass Boys were born. Over the next two years, the band recorded several successful songs for Columbia Records, including Blue Moon of Kentucky, which became a hit again in 1954 when a young, unknown singer called Elvis Presley covered the song for the B-side of his very first single. Flat and Scruggs left the band in the late 1940s, but Bill Monroe's success continued. The New York Times referred to him as the universally recognized father of bluegrass and reported that he helped lay the foundation of country music. By the time Monroe returned to the Hoosier State in the early 1950s, the Brown County Jamboree had become hugely popular. Bill Monroe began playing at the popular Brown County Jamboree by 1951. Likely, it was that same year that Bill decided to purchase the Jamboree grounds from local owners May and Francis Rund. When Monroe took over operations, he kept the regular Sunday Jamboree show that had been running May through November for over a decade. But he needed a new angle to maintain its popularity. As rock and roll took over the airwaves in the first half of the 1950s, less people came to Bean Blossom seeking country music. However, with the revival of the folk movement in the late 1950s and early 60s, Bill Monroe and his unique style of bluegrass attracted national attention once more. This reinvigorated interest in Bean Blossom as well, and the time felt right for Monroe's next move, a large annual bluegrass festival. On June 24th and 25th, 1967, Bill Monroe hosted the first festival, which he called the Big Bluegrass Celebration. The next year, the festival had to be extended to three days to accommodate the large crowd of 10,000 music lovers. In 1969, the event was billed as Bill Monroe's Bluegrass Festival, and the grounds were now referred to as the Brown County Jamboree Park. By the 1970s, the festival had evolved into an international event, with musicians and attendees coming to Bean Blossom from across the world, even as far away as New Zealand and Japan. 
Bill Monroe remained active in festival activities until his death in 1996, but his legacy continues at Bean Blossom today. Just last year, the park, now known as Bill Monroe's Memorial Park and Campground, held its 50th annual Bill Monroe Memorial Bean Blossom Bluegrass Festival. Here, visitors are seen pausing in front of a new state historical marker and remembering the handful of Bean Blossom residents who started it all with one lone microphone and an amplifier in the parking lot of an old filling station and a deep love for country music. Events are happening year-round at the Bill Monroe Music Park. Learn more at BillMonroeMusicPark.com. And if you'd like to learn more about incredible Indiana history, be sure to check out the Indiana Historical Bureau. They've been marking Indiana history since 1915 and are helping us bring you the story. Learn more at in.gov history. Our next guest certainly understands the passion of Americana. Meet Jason Wilbur. I remember I took a guitar class in sixth grade. I thought it was something I would do for a little while, but I just kept doing it and the years went by and it was a lot of fun and still is. So I guess that's why I'm still doing it. <laughs> I've been playing in John Prine's band for about almost 22 years now. When I was 26 years old, I started playing in February of 96. It was the second half of a tour he had for a record called Lost Dogs and Mixed Blessings. Because I was writing songs and I wanted to have an outlet for those, I have ideas for songs and I feel the need to let those out and document them and work on them, it's what I enjoy. When you're a songwriter, if you write a bunch of songs, you might find a person to sing one or two of them occasionally, but if you really want a lot of your songs to get out there, you kind of have to sing them yourself. Or at least I did, so. <laughs> so that's what I chose to do. The recording process is a lot of fun. It's very collaborative and it's kind of a process of discovery. You take a song and you maybe have an idea of how it's going to go, but I kind of like to explore things as we're recording and just see what works and what doesn't work. And it's just really fun to see where things lead and building on things. A lot of times the things you think are going to be really good just end up being okay and the things you just thought were going to be okay end up being great, you know, so it's fun. It's fun. It's kind of an adventure. Hey, if you want to be a musician, do it because you really love it and you can't stand not to do it. Because otherwise, bad times are probably going to be bad enough that you'll stop. <laughs> that makes sense. But if you really love it, then it's easier to, to take the bad times. Singing for me didn't really come naturally. I've worked a lot on practicing and taking lessons and things like that. It's hard to write good songs. You got to write a lot of bad ones, it seems like, to get to the good ones. But I think the hardest thing sometimes is just hanging in there and just doing it. Because a lot of times things don't turn out the way you expect or people don't like something that you think is really good. And if you get upset every time, you're going to be upset all the time. The part that requires more perseverance is being willing to go out there and put it out into the world and make recordings and do performances because that's when you open yourself up for rejection, potential rejection at least. I would say that's a painful part of it, but the fact that it brings me so much pleasure and joy just to do it even if no one's listening is what kind of keeps me doing it, I think. Just being able to make a living doing something you love, like play music, is an accomplishment. So I've been fortunate to do that for a long time. In the end, I really love making music. It's what makes me feel really alive, and it's what I think about when I get up in the morning. If I'm enjoying it and feeling engaged and having a good time and making music that I think is really good and people are enjoying it, I feel like that's a sign that that's what I'm supposed to be doing, or at least that's what I feel like doing. So <laughs> I'm going to keep doing it till somebody stops me, I guess. And now, welcome Jason Wilbur. Never doubted I 
To learn more about Jason's latest album, Reaction Time, or to find upcoming performances, visit his website, jasonwilbur.com. That's all we have for tonight. We hope you find beautiful ways to embrace your time in changing seasons. Once again, before we go, Jason Wilbur. start unwinding Saturday morning we're free Sunday we'll be sorry to see you go 
she'll have to wait a whole week. It's been all right. Oh, but I love another Saturday night. When we were young, we speculated on the meaning of life and love. Rivers turn. It's been all right. Oh, but I love another Saturday night. Far away in a dream out there. Beyond the weekend. Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington. Addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. Smithville Fiber, a Giga City company. Fiber internet, HD, and digital IPTV in southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund. Established by friends and family of Al Cobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you 